there, I was thinking about 104 when the rain stops. So y'all go ahead and get ready to slide in when the 100 comes in. <laughs> God is so good all the time. Oh, Let's see if I can do this right here. There we go. All right. Let's say this together. These are the two most important hours of my week. Help me to cherish them. I'm here today to worship, not to be entertained. I'm singing to an audience of one, except my worship, O oh Lord. Let's do our next, this is for our new year. We need to say, look, this will be the last, this will be the last sermon on KISS. The war's coming, but it's not going to be called KISS anymore, okay? Are you ready? Uh, Thank you, God, for this new year, this new start, these new opportunities, these new challenges, these new victories. Help us take advantage of these new opportunities. Give the Lord a hand clap. Okay. Now we're going to go ahead and do our, the, the, our theme song. And all this is going to change next week, but it's our theme song we've been playing all the way. I'm going to make sure I'm turned on. Now let's see here. Try to turn out the PA and we got to turn on the bass. There we go. Ready?
thank you, Lord, for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you, God, for all that you do and all that you say in your word. We thank you, God, that you are alive and well and everything is done. Lord, in our lives, God, you're watching and you desire control. Ask your ideal to help us, Lord. Touch Jeanette, touch Catherine's mom, touch my wife, touch Barbara, touch Lord uh, Frankie. Lord, they all need a touch in their bodies. Ask you to touch them right now. Lift them up, Lord. I know with this rain, it really does affect a lot of people in a lot of bad ways. Help them. And we thank you for it right now. In the name of Jesus, we pray. The church said, Amen. 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 Got it that time, ready? Here we go. You already seen some more. Oh, 
Before, before I forget, John, did you notice you left your wallet at home this morning? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm talking about today. Order! I think a hamburger. <laughs> no, that kind of order. We're going to talk about, well, you'll we'll see as we get going along. The seven principles of keeping simple saints. Amen. Striving, striving from striving or from surviving to thriving. Get ready. Here it is. Do not judge. Do not judge that you will not be judged. Here it goes. Ready? This world is collapsing around us. And our world does not even have a clue of how to handle what's going on. Putin just this week said, and heard one of his ministers said, that they're getting ready to wipe, and I know part of it's all propaganda, but propaganda works, that's why they keep doing it. He said that they were going to take the United States and blow them off the map. And he was going to, they were going to name this uh, straight, the straight of linen. There's a lot of stuff being said out there, all these balloons being going over the United States, and all this stuff going on, they shot down other balloons. The world is collapsing around us, but our world doesn't even have a clue how to handle this. So today, the final installment, the solution is grace, not the gavel. Grace, not the gavel. Amen? So let's go a little bit further here. We need to learn that we need to learn how to step beyond our pride. Drop the gavel. Dr. Gavel and pick up the cross. Amen? Amen? It's very, very, very important. My matter of fact, how many in here sometimes even find out or even realize that huh, you wake up one morning with a bad attitude, you're in a wrong situation, you're on the wrong side of the bed, and your day becomes a judgmental day. The name of this sermon is Don't Judge Me, Bro. You heard it, Don't Taste Me, Bro. This one is, don't judge me, bro. You see, we don't understand something. When we judge people, we set ourselves up in a lot more situation than the people that we judge. We're not the judge. Amen? So let's read this. Matthew, and, and then we're going to, I'll read this and then we're going to pray. Judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, you shall also be measured to you again. While the whole is the moat, the speck, the sawdust in your brother's eye, when you don't consider the beam, the telephone pole, the two by four in your own eye. So now, let's get rid of it. Here it is. Don't judge me, bro. Don't judge me. Look, I got an extra camel in my back pocket. Just in case I break one, I got an extra one. Anybody ever done that? You ready to judge it? I'm ready to judge you. I can judge you. If you break that gap, I got a second. Ain't no problem. So get ready. Get ready. One of the most misunderstood scriptures in the Bible is Matthew 7, 1 through 5. Why is this so misunderstood? I'm here to tell you. Judge has multiple meanings in the Greek. <laughs> The first meaning is actually to condemn. God says, I don't need you condemning one another. It means you become the judge and jury and you pass sentence. Think about it. When you judge somebody, think about it as hard. Look. When you judge somebody, you become judge, jury, and you pass sentence. Only God can do that. He's the only one. He's the only one. The number two meaning of judge in the Bible is to discern. He says we can discern a tree by the fruit that it bears. This word here means this. When you see the situation and you understand what's going on. You're not judging now. You're discerning by actions. Okay? One thing I can discern your actions, and that can be adequate and accurate, discerning your actions. But when I pass sentence on those actions, now I've gone too far. 
As long as I'm deserting it and saying, you know what, I'm not going to leave it alone because this is going to cause trouble. I'm not going to let that pass because that just doesn't seem right. Or, or maybe they're telling me one thing, but I'm feeling another. That's deserting. When somebody does something and now you become the judge and jury, God says, don't do that. So now, we're going to talk about this. We're going to start out first. <laughs> Again, uh, this morning, where'd it go? There it is, but you know what? There's no little problem. It's not, I couldn't even my God with this way. This morning has been everything been discombobulated. We're going to be all right. Like, it's a very short video. As a matter of fact, I, it's so short you don't even see it. Hold on, hold on, please hold on, don't judge me. I was trying to send this, send it out, and I had to send, I had to shorten the file, and I think what I did was I put the wrong button up here. Hold on. Yep, it's the wrong one. That's why I was like, hold on. Don't judge me, bro. It's coming. <laughs> like that. Yeah, don't do it again. All right. <laughs> now we can see it. Y'all ready? Just about there.
An Indian saying is, don't judge a run of the brave until you walk a mile in his moccasins. Wow. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Luke 6, 37. Again, let's just take this. I want to show this scripture. These, these scriptures have been ringing in my head for several weeks now. So I've been trying to get it all together. And this actually was going to be my Bible last week's sermon. And I felt like the Lord was telling me, no, this needs to be all on its own. And so that's why uh, I got gavels. Uh, got Brother Wayne brought a gavel. And I brought a gavel. Just in case this one doesn't do the job, I got two gavels. I don't know if those ever do that. I mean, this don't work. All right. Matthew said one through two, the message. Don't pick on people, jump on their failures, criticize their faults, unless, of course, you want the same treatment. That critical spirit has a way of boomerang. Let's just go a little bit further. <clears throat> Matthew 7, 1 through 5, the Amplified Version. Do not judge, criticize, and condemn others so that you may not be judged, criticized, and condemned yourselves. For just as you judge and criticize and condemn others, you will be judged and criticized and condemned in accordance with the measure you used to, to deal out to others, it will be dealt out again to you. Why do you stare from without at the very small particle that is in your brother's eye, but do not become aware of and consider the beam of timber that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me get the tiny particle out of your eye while there's a beam of timber in your own eye? You hypocrite. First get the beam of timber out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to take the tiny particle out of your brother's eye. Right careful. But that just has to do with church folk. Just church folk on Sunday morning. I got to use that on Sunday morning. That scripture needs to be used 24 hours a day on your job, with your spouse, with your children, at your job, at Walmart, at Food Line. Wherever you go, if you can keep this in your mind and keep this in the forefront, God can use you to help a lot of people. Amen. Yesterday when Linda got out of the hospital, uh, uh, I had some plans to do some other things. So I sent her, sent her home and I said, you go to bed, you get some rest. And so she was sleeping. And I had other things. I had the whole day planned out of doing something to help somebody. You know, other plans of working actually with my hands to help some other people. And every place I went, I went to Walmart. And every, I'm not kidding. God's my witness. Every aisle I walked down. Somebody stopped me. And I wound up, I don't mean just cutting and carrying on, I'm talking about counseling. I counseled them every aisle I walked in. And finally, as I was getting ready to leave, I saw a couple I did not recognize. And I walked up and I went out and picked up some letters. I said, finally, I got that aisle, nobody knows me. And a man cut me and said, Aren't you a Christian? And I said, Yeah. And we got talking. And I said, Okay, now every hour. <laughs> every year. And then I walked out of the door and the lady, the lady was, you know, checks your bags. She said, aren't you in here kind of late? And I said, yeah, but I got in here early. She said, what happened? I said, I've been, I've been talking to people everybody. She said, no, watch this, I love it. She said, no, you were doing God's work. And it's important that you were here today. And I said, Praise God, <laughs> you know, get my car and go hunt and then start over again. So, so again, if I don't go to Walmart and start criticizing people, condemning and thinking, blah, 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 then God would never send them to me to talk with him because I would have had the wrong attitude. Let me just stop for a minute, a little side road, and, and later on when they do this, I'm not sure, and I don't have it written down on notes. It's some of the stuff that, you know, God just throws in, you know, uh, up there when God says, in, in, in James, you look at James 3, 3, 1 through 12, talks about the tongue. It says, likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body. James 3 and 5. 
The tongue is a small part of the body, but makes a great boast. Consider what a great farce is set on fire by a small spark. When he talks about your tongue, and this is usually how we judge, it starts with our attitude. We see something going on and we get a bad attitude towards what we see because you know what? I don't know your intentions. I really don't know exactly what you're doing. All I know is all I perceive. God gave me the ability to discern. And as I'm trying to discern, but I don't have all the facts, now I'm discerning wrong, and then I get a bad attitude, and then I start condemning. So watch. Here's the tongue. First is powerful. It said in verse 3, like a small bit, turning up a huge horse. Verse 4, it's forceful, like a small rudder, steers a massive ship. Verse 5, it's dangerous, like a tiny spark, it ignites a great forest. Six, it is devastating. It was like a searing fire burning the whole body. Verse 6 again is corrupt and like an evil force and, and instigated by hell. Verse 8 is untamable like a restless evil full of deadly poison. Verse 10 is contaminated like a two-faced hypocrite, both crazy and cursing others. Verse 11 is distasteful like a flowing spring and bitter with salt water. And verse 12 is contradictory like a fig tree bearing olives like a grapevine bearing figs. But our speech, well, once we stop deserting and we start judging, our attitude gets corrupted. And once our attitude gets corrupted, our actions soon follow. And usually the way our actions follow is through the tongue. And we should be helping somebody who might end up hurting them. So let's just go a little bit further here. Again, this is good stuff. It may not feel good to start with, but it's really, 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 really good stuff. Why does God forbid us to have this type of behavior, this judgmental behavior? Number one, it undermines his love, and it undermines the love in the body. Number two, it destroys community. People don't even trust anybody anymore. It creates divisiveness and distrust. It violates the kingdom's value of mercy and grace. So again, as you said, one, two, three, in the message again, don't pick on people, don't judge their failures, don't criticize their faults, unless, of course, you want the same treatment. That critical spirit has a way of boomerang. It's easy to see a smudge on your neighbor's face and be oblivious to the ugly steer on your own face. Now, we're going to dig down really kind of deep right now. Y'all say, lower the cloud, Pastor. I bet you have Ready? Get ready. I says, don't judge me. We don't know the storms that she just had to walk through. Well, let it sink in. <coughs> Don't judge a person. You have no idea what they're dealing with on the inside. You have no idea the storms that they've just been through or the storm that they are facing. So I see is number one. Reasons why we don't judge other people. I just got a few reasons. I won't keep you long today, I promise. <laughs> but if I do, don't judge me, bro. <laughs> Number one, we don't know all the facts. We don't know all the circumstances. I promise you all the facts were never known. We don't know what happened to make them be this way. We don't know why it happened because uh, uh, all the causes are just unknown. And there's also many behind the scenes facts. And all there is to know about a person is never known. So, how I find myself sometimes getting kind of tough on people. <clears throat> and I got to stop and say, wait a minute. It's not my job to reprimand them. It's my job to understand them. Everybody in this church, everybody is carrying around a bundle of pain within you. There's no exceptions. Everybody you know is fighting a battle. Some of the pain is pain now. Some, is, uh, some of the pain is pain that happened just a while ago or maybe years ago. And then some of it is childhood pain. But with all this pain that people are carrying around within them, sometimes they don't even realize how they're coming across to other people because the, their internal pain 
It's causing a strain on everything they do. I have discovered uh, Psalm 109, 22. I've discovered this about, about people. Uh, not just over at Pitt Attention Center. Because Pitt Attention Center, these people are corralled. These people are court ordered. These people are in a position where they have no other choice. If they don't do what they're supposed to be doing, they're going to wind up going to general population and they wind up pulling more time and blah, 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 blah. But people on the street, a whole different story. People in the church, a whole different story. If we're not careful, we'll see somebody in the church and, you know, Pitt Attention Center, yeah, they're locked up. I understand they got some pain somewhere, but, and I understand why they acted the way they did. But when you start talking about somebody in the church or somebody in your family, <coughs> and you don't try to find out what kind of hurt they're going through, that's the discernment that you need. That's the discernment I, I try to find out when I talk to any, any, anybody. Let me just tell you something about just a little acronym for hurt. And I'll go back to this later on down the line in another sermon. Just something to, for this morning. Hurt. That's your H R H U R T. Hurt. Number one. H. Harness. I mean, harshness. Harshness. There's a lot of people here who hurt, <clears throat> hurt all their life. Maybe not these words, but they feel these words. You're not even worth it. You may be working with somebody that drives you absolutely crazy, but you don't know that inside they're carrying that pain of a divorce, or that pain of a loss of a child, or that pain of a loss of a job, or that pain of, of being misunderstood or being overlooked, or that pain is being a child that went through some verbal, mental abuse. And in their mind, all they can think of is, I deserve harshness because I'm not worth any kindness. And so I'm going to make sure that I don't give you kindness. You, unconcerned. Because they say, I have no value. My wife, when she left me, told me I have no value. My kids tell me I have no value. My daddy told me I have no value. And so because I have no value, I don't live like I have value. That makes it hard to swing this thing, huh? Or rejection. You're not acceptable. My husband told me that when he left me. Oh, he might not have said the words, but he did it. You're not acceptable. My boss said, when you looking for that promotion because he gave me something else, I'm not acceptable. <coughs> Another kid in the school used to pick on me because I didn't look like they did. I just feel unacceptable. And so I'm going to act unacceptable. Nobody cares to understand me. All I'm going to do is judge me, so you can have it back. Wow, it gives a whole new perspective on the whole thing, doesn't it? And then finally, T, taunting. You deserve to be insulted. I can't tell you how many people have come to me and said, I deserve what I'm getting. And I go, really? Yeah, because that's all I've ever been. I deserve it! And I'm going to give it back. If we could understand that everybody in this church, in one form or another, is dealing with hurt. It would change the way we look at people. It would change the way we handle people. It even changed the way we handle ourselves. Because that 
critical spirit that we have developed as a defense mechanism to keep us from getting hurt again. I just go ahead and hurt me now so I know what's happening. So, we can only deserve people's actions. That's it. I can only deserve your actions. And even then, even at the most, when I deserve your actions, it's kind of obvious when you spill the milk. It's kind of obvious when you raise your car. It's kind of obvious when you're waddling around, around, waddling around because you've been drinking. That's all obvious. But only God can judge their attentions. They read their car not because they were being reckless. They read their car because their mind was on something entirely different because it was hurt or something going on inside the vehicle. They're drinking because they're trying to hide the pain. They're trying to mask the pain, trying to do away with the pain. I remember in, in B5, I always talk about B5, but it, it honestly, it's kind of like a, con, a conglomeration or a, a pull together of the, the masses. I remember going in there and I was doing a 12-step program, which is different than the NA and the AA do. This is a very strong program that actually brings you, tears you down and pushes you back up. About the, about the third session, it started dealing with pain. It started dealing with parents. And I said, okay guys, you don't have to share this with anybody. You don't have to even share it with me unless you want to. It's fine. But I need you to work this out. And I got them writing letters to their parents. Then I got them writing letters of apology to their parents. I got them going back and forth. And I thought that that was going to be the end of it. And then some of these big old girly guys said, Pastor, can I read mine out loud? I said, sure. And that big old guy, that was the first time I saw him, I was scared of him. He like he could just bite a two by four into it. Tears rolled down his face as he was reading. And I looked around at some of these other rough looking guys, and they were sobbing. The only guy said, Can I read mine? I said, Sure. And the sobbing continued. These guys were in each other's throats until they read this. And now it turns reading the pain. And then forgiving the ones that brought that pain. And asking for forgiveness for what they've done because of that pain. That day was a turning point. It changed the whole situation and the guys jailed. Because up until that point, they were judging each other. And after that day, they started pulling together because he understood they were all fighting hurt on the inside. It was a very powerful day. I'll never forget that day as long as I live. And remember what happened that day. So now, we don't know all the facts. I don't know every look. I don't know all the facts. I got two sons that were, were born to me, a daughter that was adopted, and two stepchildren. I got uh, my first wife died, I'm married again. And I promise you, I don't know all about all of them. I don't know all about D.C. and Daniel. I don't know all about Bethany. I don't know all about everybody. I know what I know. But we don't know all the pain and the hurt that are driving people. And because it's disguised, to keep getting hurt again, we think they're being mean to us. But actually, what they really need is kindness. So now, you don't know the facts. <clears throat> Number two. We don't know God's plan for handling this. You know, we're trying to get something going. You don't realize that God, God's already on top of it. He's already got it. You may be part of the problem or part of the solution by the way you're handling it. If you're judging them, you're part of the problem. 
That's an ouch moment or an amen moment. And so it's very important to know that God kind of goes, oops, I missed that one. Well, I'm sorry, I, didn't see, I am so sorry, I didn't see you going that way. Wow, what was I doing? I must have been watching Bonanza. Little Joe, I thought he was going to die. I didn't have a chance to walk. No. God's already working it. I choose to be part of the solution. We don't know God's paying for handling this, but God's already on it. God's going to fix it if we all pull together and be part of the team and watch what God can do. Number three, when we lose sight of the fact that how we dish it out is how it comes back. I don't know why. And I don't know why they would treat me so bad. And I find out, yeah, really? <laughs> I watched you treat somebody worse than that, bro. You actually got grace. Yeah, well, they deserved it. Oh, so now you judge. Remember, just in case it breaks, I got done. Matter of fact, I'm ambidextrous. I can judge with either hand. Next, here's the hardest one of all. We lose sight of the fact that we fall. When you start judging people, you fall in the same trap that Satan fell into. What? Isaiah 14. For that said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will set upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the most high. You pull out your gavel. You say, stop over, God. I got this. I can handle this, God. You just sit there and do what you're doing. I got this one. Wow. When I, when I was writing this and the Lord showed that to me, my heart sunk. Sunk. And I went, oh no, God. Please don't let me fall into that <laughs> trap. Wow. I get ready to close. Y'all about to shout me down, so I gotta hurry up. We all good shout. Ready? Kind of like I did for a early. Don't judge me. You don't know what storm I've asked her to walk through. God. I know this, the chosen, the chosen <laughs> have been through one hundred percent correct, but they have stories along the way. The side stories. Or perceptions of what could have been going on or what was going on or what they would think would happen. But anyway, about it, Simon Peter in the last, and I don't, here's a spoiler for you. Simon Peter in the very last episode, his wife had a miscarriage. And he got mad at God. He said, I'm killing other people. You got me sitting over here preaching these words and I'm doing things to kill other people. And my wife has a miscarriage. And Jesus told him. He said, I could have stopped it. He said, but you don't know it now. But later on, this is going to, you and your wife both, it's going to make y'all stronger. And y'all going to be used by me in a powerful way. I walked the halls of many times in the cancer center. And I, I don't understand God. <laughs> I've prayed for many persons to see them well. Here's Bethany. Then daddy don't stop fighting. When daddy, every she gets sick, they don't, don't stop fighting, daddy. Don't stop fighting, mama. Don't y'all stop fighting for me. I remember that day when the doctor said, we've got to stop the chemotherapy. And I looked at that doctor and said, she asked me not to stop fighting for her, doc. We cannot stop it. And she said, Mr. Linton, if we don't stop, the chemotherapy will kill her. We're going to keep on doing radiation on her back, but we're stopping everything else because it's going to kill her. I said, but I gave her a promise. And the doctor looked at me and said, Mr. Lynn, your promise is intact. 
you said, because you're still fighting for her. Even right here, right now, you're fighting for her. And I need you to understand that whatever we do now is very, very touchy. Whatever we do can kill her. The only way to give her a chance is to take her off of this. And again, I'm thinking, God, don't you remember how hard she had coming up being beat by her parents? And, and have to get her face rebuilt because of being beat and all this other stuff and not having her brain like everybody else and all these years getting her face rebuilt and her nose rebuilt and all this stuff going on and all this stuff in the jail and all this. God, she finally gets right again and now she's got cancer. God, isn't she going to be a miracle? God said, in my heart, you got to trust me. I don't know if you remember or not. T.C. Daniel made that video that was played during the visitation. And it was her story of her life in pictures and small videos. And the very last thing, it was her last birthday party. They were singing happy birthday to her. And when she reached, she was laughing and cackling. And when she reached over to blow out, she pulled her hair back and blew out the candles. And as she blew out the candles, the screen went blank. And then God gave me Isaiah 57. You're good down you under but people don't understand, they don't even care why. So they don't know that I'm protecting them from worse things that are coming. When they die, they find peace. Wow. Don't judge me. You know what storm God's asked me, you, whoever else to walk through. When you start judging people like that, first you get a wrong view of God. He's the judge, not of us. Sometimes we forget he sees the whole picture. He sees attitudes, actions, motives. He sees it all. We know. We get a wrong view of others. God looks on their heart. We can't. We just look on their actions. Then we get a wrong, 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 a wrong view of ourselves because God said you judge yourself first. Not the other person. You judge yourself. <laughs> and when you judge yourself, no matter how bad the other person's been, it really helps. And just so God, God, God's got a sense of humor, and He's got a way of getting right to the point. He said, "You're trying to get sawdust out of your brother's eye, and you've got a beam." One translation is telephone pole in your own eye. Wow. Powerful. You see, just to remove all of the misunderstanding, God put in verse 3. He said, I mean, it's, it's just powerful. See, here's the final thing about judging. I want you to think about this. Very, very powerful. This is not about discerning, it's about judging. There is a difference. You have to discern in order to lead people. You have to discern in order to help people. You have to discern in order to live a healthy life. You have to discern. Okay? But judge is different. Judge or judge, jury, and you pass sentence. So watch. Finally, judging blinds us to our own condition. You know you should. I miss you. Ah! What about you? I don't mind. Well, you got a problem? Look at the speck of salt in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye. How can you say to your brother, let me take a speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? I'm getting really close. I know somebody might do say, come on, we got more to go. Keep on going. Y'all say, keep on going. Keep going. There you go. Keep on going. 
Alright, I'm glad you asked. At least the Eddie did. I gotta remember that. Eddie, I got you down for a uh, merit badge. Really good. <laughs> Short lived. <laughs> Short lived. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and he said unto, said unto them, He that without sin among you, let him cast the first stone at her. They called a woman. They said, We call her in the very midst of adultery. And your law says to stone her. I got the first question is they caught her in the very midst. Where's the guy? And hmm. she was caught in the midst. There gotta be a guy somewhere. <coughs> Where's he at? Well, he's my bud. I ain't I don't hurt my bud. So Jesus just looks down and goes. And they said, well, come on. And he goes back down again. He goes, okay, you without sin, cast the first stone. I really believe he was saying, you were with her last night. And you were with her before him. And what happened to you, buddy? I see him over there. Yeah, he's writing all this stuff down. I really believe he was showing them that y'all ain't so yourself. John said, this they said, tempting him that they might accuse him. Jesus stood down with his finger on the ground as a perfect body. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said, he that was without sin among you, let him cast the first stone at her. Nobody. Nobody. Y'all say it. Nobody. Say it again. Nobody. 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 That I know has the right to throw a stone and flute my sin. So then, remember, there's a difference in discerning. God says you start to discern. You look at a tree, and if you see me through an apple tree, and I go to a strawberry bush, and I'm trying to get strawberries, you get your apples, but you have a strawberry bush. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying not to judge. Really? God said discern. So, I did it again. Here we go. Here we go. Just quick, a little, little run through. We're getting really close. Oop. My other, my other mouth is full of my pants there. I got mouths everywhere. I'm ready to go. I'm ready. Ready? Don't be judgmental, or you too will be judged. Verse 1, don't judge, or you'll be judged. Number 2, don't judge others, you'll be judged the same way, with the same standard. For in the same way you judge others, you'll be judged, and with the measure you use, you'll be measured unto you. Number 3, don't focus on small faults of others before focusing on your big faults. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? Verse 3. Verse 4, don't talk to others about their faults while you ignore your own faults. How can you say to your brother, let me take a speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in yours? I've had people come talking to me and I had to keep ducking because the plank was going to look like They stand there going, I got a bone to pick with you. Come here, brother David. And they're, they're standing right here. I had to keep ducking. Don't be hypocritical. Correct your faults before correcting someone else's. You hypocrite. It's one thing for you to call me a hypocrite because you can be wrong. But when God calls me a hypocrite, you hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, then you will see clearly the root of speck from your brother's eye.
Once you walk around, once you get everybody one, just get one. Just one. Everybody one. I'm not saying anybody's doing this. I just think human nature we're prone to it. Okay? There's a difference in saying you're doing it and I'm judging. I'm saying we're all prone to do this. And so my challenge to you today, I'm getting ready to give everybody a little cross once you put it in your pocket. And when you feel the need, again, not to deserve, but to judge, there is a difference. I want you to pick up that little cross that's in your pocket. Just put your little hand on pocket and put a little cross and go, oh yeah, right, yeah, there you go, Lord. Get back off. There's something special about this cross. 
Bethany and I were in the Walmart parking lot just before she died. And this guy was selling crosses. And, and uh, Bethany said, can we look at it there? I said, sure. And I said, well, you want a cross? She said, yeah, can I have a cross? I said, sure you can have a cross. And she had a cross that been her bitter, bitter. Now, now we keep it where we can see it all the time. It's actually another room. But she picked out this cross too. And when I see this cross, there's one thing like that. She was hard hit. Lord knows that was the hardest hit I've ever seen in my life. But the only thing thicker than her skull was the size of her heart. Amen. She could forgive and forget. She could forgive and forgive. She could reach out. She was like, oh, she, she to me was an awesome. I'm not trying to put her on the plateau because she, I can rest up, she had her faults. One of her gifts was grace. You now, some people just seem like they can pray for folks and they're healed. Other people can do whatever preaching, blah, blah, blah. Hers was she could just exhibit grace like nobody ever seen. When I see this, I think about it. And I said to myself, God, I hope I can have the ability and will develop the ability to show grace like Bethany did. Again, no pedestals. She <laughs> had to. Lord knows she did. But her grace, capabilities, was amazing. Now, did ever get by it ever that close? I know this probably seems to be the toughest one of all seven, but honestly, this was just the icing on the cake, kind of solidified all the good stuff on the <laughs> Please, if you didn't see all seven of them, haven't been here for all seven, please look them up. If you want, I can get a good outline from all seven. But your assignment is more important than you ever imagined, especially in this last day. And the biggest problem that we confront in fulfilling our assignment is us. God has a mighty, mighty, awesome thing if we just let him do it in us and through us and for us. Every hit by it, every that close. First time we just ask. You know, nobody's looking around. I'm here to say that I, <clears throat> number one, I, I am not as close as I need to be with God. I, I really should be a lot closer than I am, but, but I've let all these things you've talked about in the last seven weeks get in my way. Especially today, <laughs> there some things that I see have got in my way and sabotaged my assignment. And I just need to get closer. First off, I just need to get closer to God. You want to get closer to God? Nobody look around? Just put that hand up. I really want to be closer to God. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. <laughs> Second, who would say, I realized in the last seven weeks that I have been the big responsible one for sabotaging myself. Not everybody else, me. I've sabotaged me. And I want to do better with God's help. Put the hand up. Yes. Yes. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. And maybe, just maybe, you would say, God, I want to be all that you call me to be. Put that hand up. Bless the Lord. Bless the Let's pray together. Father, I love you. I praise you. I praise you. I thank you. I thank you for all you've done for us. I thank you for what you're doing. I know you're in control. I know you're in control. And I trust you. I trust you. I ask you right now. I ask you right now. Help me. Help me. To quit sabotaging. To quit sabotaging. Myself. Myself. It'd be all I can do for you. All I can do for you. Help me. Help me. To step forward. To step forward. In faith. In faith. Knowing. Knowing. That you got my back. That you got my back. And I thank you for it. And I thank you for it. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. This is a new day. This is a new day. Amen.
Y'all <laughs> right. Brother Wayne, you just listen to prayer, please. Let us pray. Our Father God, we thank you for the most time to assemble in thy house. We thank you for the mercy and grace you provide among us, the love that you show us, Father, and the help that you give us, Lord. We say thank you for that, Father. Father, we depart these doors today. Let us be one thing, Father. That's a lot of shining light for you, Lord. Let's let our judgmental side, Father, be put, put to rest, Lord. Let us know that you're the judge, you're the final judge, you're the ongoing judge, and we thank you for being with us. Father, we ask you to bring us all back to the next point in time. This is an awful thing. I always ask in the holy name of Jesus Christ. And this I say, amen. 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 amen.